great. Let's get started. My name is David Rotman. I'm the editor at large at MIT Technology Review. So I write a lot about technology, a lot about policy, and, but I am really honored and appreciative to be here this morning and been listening to these great discussions. And what I've heard is a lot of mention of data and big data. So I think that one of the purposes of this panel is to dig deeper into what's real, what's not real, what's, you know, what we should be worried about, what we shouldn't be worried about with big data, and, and try to make sense out of um, this, this word, data. And one of the things I noticed from the excellent panels this morning, especially Professor Erica Fuchs, I'm uh, Professor Fuchs panel, was the, what came across was we want to be able to use it for what we need, what the community, what the city needs. So it ma really made me think very much that data is just a tool. And I don't think we should be optimistic or pessimistic. I think we should try to understand what this tool is and then try to understand how we can use it to solve problems, to meet our needs as a community, as a city. And so the spirit of this panel, I hope, is the more we, the better we understand data, what it is, what's real, what it's not, the better we can make decisions on how we want to use it. And it's really up to us whether we're using it for the good, optimistically, or, pe or if it's destructive. It's a decision that we're facing how to use it, and the better we understand it, the better we'll be in making that decision. So I hope that's the spirit of this panel. Um, we have some great experts on data and people that have thought a lot about the implications of it. So I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to ask each panelist to sort of talk about what they do and on the theme that I just introduced and then we'll have a common discussion, I hope, about how we think we can better use data to serve the needs and solve problems. So Eric, please. Uh, Could, And could I e ask each of the panelists to sort of introduce yourself, what you do, what you think about? Sure. Thank you. I'm Eric Bernolson. I'm a professor at MIT. I'm the director of the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy. I like very much your opening remarks. It's very much in line with the way I think about this. Uh, there's been a, a revolution in the availability of data. We have many orders of magnitude more digital data, data available now than we ever had before. Um, and uh, although I agree very much with the techno-optimism panel on the, the, that we just heard from, um, there's also reasons to be concerned and, and, and be pessimistic. But ultimately, the, the right answer isn't to have either blind optimism or, or blind pessimism, but to recognize that the data is a, is a tool. There are a number of areas that data is profoundly revolutionizing, not just technology, but the economy and society. And I hope we'll get a chance to dip into a bunch of them. Uh, let me zoom in on one in particular, one where I've, I've done a lot of research, which is the ability of data, the lifeblood of machine learning. And, and we've had a machine learning revolution over the past decade or so that I still think we're only in the early days of, but we can see how profound it's becoming. And as was, has been discussed earlier in the conference, uh, there are concerns about how that's affecting the economy, jobs, inequality. So let me, let me flesh out some of the work we've been doing on that at, at MIT and, and, and elsewhere, and some of my views on that. Um, as I mentioned, um, Machine learning is very much enabled by digital data, and that's one of the reasons that we now have so much more powerful machine learning systems than we did uh, previously. People have been tinkering around with it for decades, since the 50s, really. Um, but only starting around 2012 did we start seeing these machine learning systems substantially outperform any of the other approaches. In vision systems, for instance, uh, image recognition was maybe 70% on the ImageNet database previously, and Jeff Pinton and his colleagues introduced machine learning systems, and now it's 95, 97, 98%, which actually is better than humans on the same data set, 14 million images. I have to confess, I can't always recognize the different breeds of dog or jaguar versus leopard, but the machine learning system can. And that's a real profound milestone. Similarly, we all have experience with you know, voice recognition. You know, it's not perfect when you walk down the street in Manhattan, you see people talking on their phone, and you generally don't know, are they talking to another human? or are they talking to the machine and expect the machine to talk back? They're not the most profound conversations, and we all see the errors, but 
this is an unusual 10 year period where we're going from us not being able to talk to our machines to us routinely talking to machines um, in, in uh, diagnosis, uh, radiology, many other areas. I could go through a long list of milestones that have been hit. But let me not dwell on, on the technology part because the bigger issue is what's happening to technology, to society and the economy. And in particular, I've, I've heard already, and you always hear a concern about jobs, inequality. Um, no question our economy is going through a big structural transformation and it's likely to get much more severe. I want to emphasize, however, that all of the, just about all of the technologies I talked to agree that we are very far from artificial general intelligence. What you see in, in Hollywood, the Terminator, you know, machines that can do the full range of the tasks, the tens of thousands of tasks that humans can do. That said, it's not like it's, this is an insignificant change. What we do have is extremely powerful, narrow artificial intelligence. They can do particular tasks better human, and that set of tasks is growing very rapidly and the quality is growing very rapidly. So the right way to analyze this isn't that all the jobs are going to disappear. I'm quite confident that at least in the, in the next several decades, we will not see the end of work uh, for humans. <laughs> There's far too much work that only humans can do in whether it's in child care, health care, creative work, the arts, sciences, entrepreneurship, many, many things that just machines are just incapable of doing. But in these particular tasks, we, we do see very powerful machines. Um, and let me just pick one profession that I, I didn't discuss a lot. With what what Chuck I just mentioned before, I'll, let me talk about radiology, a white collar job that maybe more of our, uh, our colleagues in this room are to do those kinds of work. Um, and that's being very profoundly effective. Machines can now uh, recognize cancer, uh, lung disease, uh, many other diseases better than humans. If hardly a week goes by, you don't see an article in Nature or Science or Archive where these are, 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 uh, these are posted that shows head-to-head -head competitions where the machine is able to recognize these diseases better than human radiologists. But we've done a study um, of looking at the tasks that are suitable for machine learning. And while image recognition is one, radiologists do many other tasks according to ONET, a big data set of, of occupations. Um, Radiologists do about 27 distinct tasks, and uh, this data set is very nice. It's, it's enumerated all the occupation, all the tasks of thousands of occupations, uh, 18,000 tasks overall that we've looked at. And uh, in the case of radiologists, they also uh, formulate diagnoses, they coordinate care with other doctors, they uh, can, uh, advise patients. These are things that machines are, are not really capable of doing. They even sometimes do physical exams. Um, and we found that the majority of the tasks that radiologists do actually are not affected by machine learning. And when we went through every one of the occupations in the data set, we did not find a single one where machine learning ran the table and was able to do the whole set. In each case, there were particular tasks that machine learning was able to do well, and other tasks that machine learning was not able to do well. So our takeaway, this is just, you can read about this in, 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 our, in our article in Science, um, is that uh, machine learning will be very disruptive these occupations are going to have to change a great deal. And entrepreneurs and managers and people in the occupation itself are going to have to rethink how work is done, which parts are done by machines, which parts are done by humans. Um, but it won't be as simple as just swapping out a human and replacing it with a machine. It's much more complicated than that. And as a result, we're actually seeing a fairly lengthy period of disruption. Um, and one of the reasons we haven't seen as much productivity gains as you might have expected from these powerful technologies is that that re-engineering, that redesign, that reinvention uh, is hard. It takes time. It's, it's a human, social, economic, managerial set of tasks um, that historically can take years or decades. I heard people talk about the, the disruption of electricity on the earlier panel. And um, there was actually about a 30-year period before electricity led to significant productivity gains, believe it or not. Uh, introduced in the 1890s, it was the 1920s before you had big productivity gains. Why? I don't think anyone would say it's because technology, because electricity was a dud, it was overhyped. You know, electricity was pretty impressive. The reason was that factories had to be reinvented. There was a new kind of a factory built around small electric motors where each piece of equipment had its own power source. Uh, shifting from the steam engine where they had a single big power source in the middle that was going to totally crankshaft. 
that reinvention of the factory was not obvious at the time. You read debates about how you should configure it. And it, sadly, it took for it about 30 years, which not coincidentally is about how long it takes for a generation of managers to retire or die, <laughs> and a new generation of managers to come in with a new approach. Similarly, we are going through a big disruption that is enabled by uh, the machine learning and other technologies that are data driven. And um, a lot of our choices will drive not only whether we harness the productivity, but also whether we're going to have not just prosperity, but shared prosperity. So I'll come back to what you said at the beginning, uh, David, that this is a tool, these are more powerful tools, literally, than we've ever had before in history. Which by definition, if you think about it, that means we have more power to shape the world than we've ever had before. And the implication of that in turn is that our values matter more than ever because we have more, uh, 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 the choices we make will have more of an impact on all of society than the choices people made earlier because of these more powerful tools. So I want to very much sum up with the idea that we shouldn't be just blind optimists or blind pessimists. We should be, I call it mindful optimists, that if we use these tools the right way, the next decade could be one of the next, the best decades we've ever had in human history. But if we use them the wrong way, it could also be one of the worst decades. And those, that outcome will depend not on our tools, but on our choices. Right. That's great. I think it really reinforces what I began thinking this morning. We really have this a period of time where we really there's a great opportunity to shape these choices. And, and that's why it's important to understand the underlying changes in the technology, which I know you think about a lot. And t so I'm think really looking forward to you to telling us what's real about big data, what's not real, and where is it headed? Yeah, so you, know, you think about this, you know, think of it, millions of jobs lost to automation, hundreds to crime, the automation apocalypse. The federal government plastered in billboards everywhere with slogans like, you won't get tomorrow's job with yesterday's skills. A president that offers that the major domestic challenge is to maintain full employment at a time when automation, of course, is replacing people new laws to retrain the victims of automation, endless working groups, including international groups, bringing, uh, bringing together governments from across the world um, to, to try to regulate the coming automation apocalypse when humans will no longer be employed. Of course, the time of the 1960s, half a century ago. Well, and this is what's really fascinating, is you look at this. In the 1960s, we underwent the same situation, um, where it was believed that within the end of the decade, a huge portion of, of human-based employment would be replaced by machines. Um, you know, ironically, actually, Congressional Quarterly at the time had this big list of all the jobs that were going to be gone by the end of the decade. Um, a, a huge, in fact, the majority of those all survived. Whether it's automobile mechanics, welders, computer programmers, all those jobs survived. They may have changed slightly, but they survived. Um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, there are a, a whole set of jobs today that do exist purely, you know, until automation takes over. Uh, ride share drivers, content moderators. You know, these, these jobs do exist purely to train what is, you know, what their companies that employ them eventually see as their automated replacements. Um, but it's also, you know, important to kind of put this in historical context that we've been here before. Um, you know, the real question is, is today's, uh, you know, is today's kind of shift something different? You know, half a century ago, it was more manual labor. Today, it's more the knowledge workers. Is this something fundamentally different? Um, you know, of course, as Elon Musk famously um, even when it comes to manual labor, you can't just take a person in a, in a factory and like, drop a robot in, it doesn't work that easily. Um, you know, it, it's interesting because right now there's this breathtaking disconnect between the hype, almost hyperbolic, hyperbolic of craze of AI and sort of the reality of what we actually have today. Yes, AI systems can do amazing things in the labs, but deploying them in the real world, they tend to fall over pretty quickly. A flawless summary turns into gibberish with a single comma out of place. The Shedd Aquarium is the world's largest seafood restaurant. Um, the Saudi king is a pastry chef. Um, you know, these are all real outcomes from today's state-of-the-art AI systems. Um, you know, today's correlative AI systems are just that. They search for simplistic correlations. Um, they lack the real-world knowledge to actually understand what those patterns are. They don't actually understand what they're learning. They just find that, hey, there's patterns in this data. Um, any patterns. That means that they require enormous volumes of highly diverse and representative training data, which is rarely uh, existent. Even driverless cars, many of the driverless cars today key parts of that technology, especially things around, for example, when to actually start the car, or stop the car at a stoplight, um, those are still hand-coded in a number of the current systems that are deployed because they don't trust machine learning to, under, to learn all those disparate cases. Um, so, you know, is it posed to take over a job today? Not quite yet, and neither is the, is the world of big data 
Um, you know, the world of big data, you know, we, we have this wonderful catchphrase of big data. Um, yes, it's true, the data is everywhere. It's being hoovered up on us every moment. Um, you know, we talk about China's social credit system as something unique. That's existed here for quite some time through Silicon Valley. You know, your Uber driver gives you a score every time you step out of the car. Um, social media companies quietly assign risk scores to you all the time. The public square in the digital world is private property. Everything we do, say and see, is being logged. The offline world, we're being tracked, whether it's through our cell phones, surveillance networks. Supposedly, all this data helps companies make better decisions, helps Silicon Valley to understand our deepest darkest dreams and fears and, and the desires and manipulate us to do its better fitting. The reality is that most of this data is wrong. When we talk about you know, that our, our modern digital society is being driven by data, um, it's, it's really telling that so much of that data is wrong. Um, when we talk about data and privacy, we tend to talk about Silicon Valley. It's the data brokers, really. It's the whole industry of data brokers that really are the Orwellian ones. Um, and in a piece recently, um, I went and to all the companies that Facebook uh, formerly bought its data from, the data brokers, requested all that data. 75% of it was wrong. All the critical fields were wrong. And you know, it, it was so wrong as to be almost comically wrong. Um, and what's interesting about this, and, you know, and then you look at social media, you know, Twitter's dropped from 500 million tweets a day to 340 million tweets a day. Um, it's risen to 50% of tweets are retweets, 12% are retweets of verified users. GPS tagged uh, maps should never have even existed. Um, you know, we talk about all these things, the representation of social media. We talk about all these things, um, but we don't actually, very few people actually study the, uh, actually, actually stop to ask the questions of the data they're using. Today it's kind of like, here's a data set, I'm gonna grab it and run with it. I'm gonna plug it, how it get a result, and run with that. Um, you know, we, we, we grab all this data every day without asking the questions about it. Um, you know, I spent 20 years working with most of the Fortune 500. You know, these are the companies you read about every day, oh, they're using AI and big data, and look at all this amazing success they're having. Then you actually sit down with them and actually work through, and actually work with them. It's amazing the companies haven't gone bankrupt. I mean, it, it's amazing that horrific quality of the data and the tools that are out there today. Um, when we used to build algorithms by hand, um, we got to really know our data, its limitations, its nuances. Today you just grab whatever you can download for free from the web, shovel the algorithms, and out it goes. We talk about the biased data and biased algorithms as if this is some kind of inevitability. It's because trillion dollar companies don't want to spend the money it takes to generate or collect data that actually represents an incredibly diverse world. Um, you know, we talk about you know, our fears in the AI future. We can't rush forward past it. A driverless car could actually kill people. Um, but you're not rushing to say, hey, we've got to put a hold on this. You know, pedestrians have been run over. You know, these are people who didn't even sign up to be a guinea pig. Um, and yet, you know, we're not, we're rushing. You think about the, you know, automation led to three plane crashes. Um, the reaction from the regulators is not, well, we got to pull back on automation. It's, you know what, we got to push the human completely out of the cockpit now. Um, you know, this is a really kind of interesting world. We talk about, um, you know, that, hey, you know, we, we need to delete Facebook. The privacy is so important to us. But yet, we don't delete Facebook. Um, you know, big data, it can do amazing things. In fact, my data was actually used um, to set out one of the very first alerts, the first extra alerts to the coronavirus. Um, you know, it has incredible applications in business and medicine and these other areas. But this idea that big data is turning us into mindless robots is going to allow these companies, um, you know, to, to do so much to us. Then there's a lot, there's, there's a lot of falsehoods to that. You know, Cambridge Analytica got so much credit for the 2016 election. People forget Ted Cruz was actually the first to deploy it. It didn't end up so well for him. Um, you know, so much of this hype about you know, data, yes, data and AI have incredible potential. They're being used in incredible ways in many industries. Um, but the problem is that there's kind of this broader hype that, my God, you know, the singularity is right around the corner, that, you know, my God, data, you know, we're mindless, uh, you know, drones to data. It, it's, it's not quite the case. Um, you know, the impact is incremental. It's, it's having impacts in certain key fields. Um, this idea that, you know, it's going to replace it, yes, it's, I mean, it's really the same theory that we had half a century ago. It could do some amazing things, but, you know, today's more to AI has very real limits. The data that powers our modern systems has got so many issues to it. So in the end, yes, it's changing a lot, but the reality is much more mundane. We're going to have this continual process forward. It is going to have an impact, um, but it's not that, you know, my God, you know, in, in five years there's no human employment anymore. Hi, everybody. I'm Laura DiNardis. I'm a professor and this year also the dean of the School of Communication at American University. So I live and work in Washington, D.C., and it's great to be out of Washington today, not just New York, I like to be here. Um, I have, I'm an internet governance scholar. Uh, that's what people call me anyway. I'm an engineer by training. But I study how arrangements of technology are also arrangements of power. So I look at the technology and I analyze it for the uh, public policy and human rights implications of that. And I also look at it from a legal standpoint. And uh, before I joined American, I taught at Yale Law School. So I was there for five years. Uh, so law, technology, and the public policy implications of architecture. And <clears throat> I think the reason
reason I'm on this panel is because I've just written my, um, it's now my sixth book about internet governance, and it's about how the internet is no longer in through, entered through display screens, but it's in the physical world all around us. So it's called the, um, the internet has a scary eye on it. Uh, the internet in everything, freedom and security in a world with no off switch. And to convey the message, you know, just in, in, in direct response to the prompt, where is data and what is big data doing? It is now not uh, related to humans as much as it is objects. There are far more things than people connected to the internet. And uh, someone said, why don't I just read the, uh, the first paragraph of my book, if you'll just indulge me. It's, um, it's, an, it's a fiction work that's based in reality, the, the first paragraph. So I challenged myself with the question, what would the internet be doing if humans suddenly left the earth? <laughs> if humans suddenly vanished from earth, the digital world would still vibrantly hum. Surveillance cameras scanning streets from Beijing to Washington would still stream video. Self-driving trucks would haul material around an Australian mine. Russian social media bots would circulate political propaganda. Internet-connected thermostats would regulate home climate. <laughs> Robots would move merchandise around massive warehouses. Environmental sensors would gauge air pollution levels. A giraffe wandering through a game reserve would trigger a motion detector that opens a gate. Bank accounts would make mortgage payments. Servers would mine Bitcoin until electricity stops flowing. Cyberspace lives. And I wrote this to try to capture how far digital systems have leapt from human-facing display screens into the physical world of material objects all around us. The main idea of that and how it's relevant to how this is a disruption, this is the data and disruption panel, that this disrupts internet governance and human rights in every way because the internet is no longer a communication system. It's a control network in which more things than people are connected and in which conflicts over that infrastructure are a proxy for political power. And we see that in many ways. What that means though is that we have to not think of the digital world and the physical world as distinct. And I, I noticed the three uh, case studies uh, from yesterday and I'm, I'm sorry that I couldn't, I was, um, I had two book talks yesterday, I couldn't come yesterday, but look at these case studies. The future of agriculture, the future of manufacturing, the future of healthcare. What they all have in common is that you can't really distinguish the physical world from the digital world anymore. All of these have deeply embedded cyber components in the physical materiality around these industries. So the whole world right now is, is fixated on content, important content issues online. Fake news, disinformation, political propaganda, hate speech. But to me, I wrote this book because I think the far more consequential issue is that the internet is deeply embedded in the physical world. The stakes for society could not be higher. So as the internet has leapt from 2D into 3D, internet governance has to also leap from 2D into 3D. We've already heard a lot about the consequences of this move to labor and th the right to work. We've heard about the consequences for privacy, where instead of a privacy breach being about disrupting um, or, or, or discovering the contents of my email, it's about discovering the contents of what I do in the most intimate realms of my personal life and our personal lives, in our homes, in our bedrooms, in our bathrooms, in our kitchens, in our workplaces, in our cars. And most notably, the security implications of this are heightened dramatically because instead of uh, a disruption or a cybersecurity hack disrupting our ability to access a bank account, it could potentially kill someone. So this is a consumer safety issue. Now, I'm not a dystopian person, and the book is a, is a very positive view of technology and the ways that all of these connect to economic efficiency, to our ability to uh, have human flourishing and to live. And, and anyone who has a relative with Alzheimer's uh, 
or uh, maybe has a disability themselves purely understands how these technologies help. But they also create new internet governance challenges, and I think that we should acknowledge that. And I'll just um, end with uh, asking, well, how does this require changes in definitions of everything that we're talking about? It changes the nature of what counts as a tech company, for one example. So now all firms are tech companies. They all gather data, they all require strong cybersecurity to function, and they all have to establish terms of service that profoundly affect consumer safety, national security, and privacy. It also changes what counts as an internet user because more things than people are connected. And even if you think about what's online as people, a lot of people online are actually bots. And I, just as an aside, I looked up the word bot in a family uh, Webster's Dictionary from the pre-Civil War era. I do that quite a lot. I say, it was this term from technology in existence around 1850? And do you know that bot is actually in the dictionary? And it means intestinal parasites in horses. So it's actually <laughs> quite apropos uh, to use that word. But these bots online are, many of them, you know, we think of humans online, many of them are not humans at all, they're bots. So what is an internet user? And even someone who has never been on the internet, and a lot of people around the world have never been on the internet, I, I study global internet governance. Well, they're profoundly affected by this transformation. Someone even who was affected, someone who uh, has never been online could have been affected by the target data breach or the office of personnel management breach or the fact that they're caught up in facial recognition on the streets of Beijing or the fact that they are uh, driving in a car that has data collection, which can then in turn be used for um, algorithmic discrimination for their employment, for their insurance rates, and things like racial profiling. So internet user is no longer a term that I am going to use in my work. And then finally, it disrupts uh, the category of what counts as freedom online. Um, so I'm a big free speech advocate, I always have been, but it, values around internet freedom have to really turn more towards cybersecurity than anything else. If you think about what this, trans, uh, this transformation means for national security and for our ability to stay safe. So cybersecurity is now the great human rights issue of our time. And I, I posit in the book that this transformation of the internet from a communication system to a control system and the internet being in everything, if you think about the consequences of it, it may be a more tra profound transformation than even our move from an industrial society to an information society. So uh, that's my take on this, and thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Suru Shabasu. I'm with IBM Research and uh, focusing on And in addition to that, I'm also the uh, IBM director for the center that we have at uh, Columbia University to look at uh, basically the topics of blockchain and data transparency. And I will tell you more about that toward you know, the end of my opening. But before I answer that question that David, you asked, I was actually uh, recording the number of times in the first two panels that we mentioned AI, transparency, privacy, and socks, and blockchain. It was 18 for AI. 10 for transparency and privacy, trust six times, and blockchain just five. And four out of five was mentioned by Peter. Uh, the reason I'm telling you this is, don't worry, I'm going to talk a lot about blockchain in my opening. And also, um, uh, the, 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 the fact about you know, the question that you asked, uh, David, is I'm going to answer it in three different parts. One is, is, is big data real? Right. I'm going to give you some statistics about what you're seeing, the explosion of data and the trends. The second part I want to talk about if AI and blockchain is real, is it hype, how much of that is real, how much of that is happening in the industry, and how many people are looking at it. And finally, some of the challenges that you're, we are working with universities, with the Columbia on the blockchain and data transparency, with MIT on AI, to just you know, understand some of the research, the leading uh, issues, you know, that we need to, to look into. 
The first part about data being real or not, the big data is real. Uh, of course, you have all seen the, the exponential growth in the data in many industries, in every industry. And there are two reasons for that. One is uh, we have now technologies that can generate data. We have now technologies that can capture and record this data, which we didn't have before. And that's one of the major reasons that we are seeing exponential growth in data. The other reason is the regulatory you know, needs for uh, the, the capturing of this issue and analyzing and auditing. Uh, because of that, you know, I've seen the statistics that said by 2025, we are all going to sit on 165 zettabytes of data. Right? Uh, to just give you a sense about what this means, if you take a grain of rice as one byte of data, one zettabyte will fill the whole Pacific Ocean. 165 zettabytes means 165 Pacific Ocean field with rice, right? It is real, but the problem is not all of this data is readable, as you know you mentioned, as well as that, right? Uh, it, this data, most of them is noisy. The statistic is that 80% of the data that we have is is noisy, and in fact, in future, we are going to see even bigger trend. 90% of the data will be noisy, dark, you know, unreadable, incomplete, and there are challenges that needs to be added. And just in healthcare, as one example, each one of us during our lifetime are going to generate about uh, 1,100 petabytes of data. That's equivalent to 300 million books, right? Just for each of us. But the reality is, if you look at the type of data that we're generating, we have clinical data, we have genomics data, we have what we call exogenous data. Today, when we go to the doctor, only they're using the clinical data to really uh, understand about their health. And the interesting thing is that clinical data is only addressing or only determining 10% of health of a person. 30% of the determination of the health of a person comes from genomics data. And 60% of that comes from the exogenous data, like environment, socioeconomic uh, issues, and things like that, right? The fact. Uh, the reality is, yes, data is growing, data is growing exponentially, but uh, that brings the need for AI. Uh, if you think about this, when the data is growing with such a large rate, you cannot rely on what we call the programmable systems error. The programmable systems are error is, if I see a trend in the data, if I see a pattern in the data, I just code it, right? I hire a software engineer, they go and just start coding and saying if, then, else. But when the data is growing exponentially, you cannot hire, you cannot even train enough software engineers that can come and read the data and write the programs to capture those trends. That's exactly why we need AI, and that's exactly why AI will be there and will be the dominant player in the future, right? But then the reality is AI brings a lot of value. But most of the value that we see in the data comes from AI. But if that's the case, then we all have responsibility when we are dealing with AI and data. If all the value that we get for our society, for our community, for our businesses, for our economy is coming from AI, there are some principles that we all need to really respect. First and foremost, the, more, the most important thing is transparency and trust. We need to create a system of trust and transparency. Let me tell you, as it was mentioned, unless you create a system of trust and transparency, people are not going to contribute their data. Me as a patient, you know, uh, there has been, in fact, some statistics, some analysis that the that survey that was done and asked people, are you okay to sh sharing your data for the algorithms to learn and, and help you? 87% of the people said, if I know that this algorithm is being trained to help me and my society, I'm okay. But the problem that we have today is people, right, you and I, we don't know who is using our data, where is it going, who is training it, for what purpose. And unless we create that system of trust and transparency, we are not going to create quality data. And if you don't have a quality data, you're not going to have a quality AI system. AI is garbage in, garbage out, right? You, you feed the garbage data to the AI, you're going to get a bad results. If we want to create that system, we need to create a trust. And of course, on top of that, the security, right? That brings me to my next point around blockchain. 
the whole idea of blockchain for those of you who might not be familiar or, or have heard it in the context of Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, blockchain is not Bitcoin. It's not cryptocurrency. It's the underlying technology that really uh, make the, the Bitcoin or cryptocurrency to happen. It's a technology that can be used for many other purposes, including many other industries who are using it today, like the food industry, like the, the, the global shipping, the work that we are doing with Maersk and others around bringing this transparency into every transaction that's happening from a parcel going from point A to point B. Blockchain today has shown its value and provenance. A lot of use cases that we see, a lot of interest in many industries, including healthcare, food, food, you know, the, the global uh, trade, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the global shipping. People see the value. But <clears throat> so far, I would say, for the last decade, there was a lot of hype. There was a lot of, you know, uh, what I call the tourism for, for blockchain. People are coming just doing the POC and to understand what this is, they didn't want to be, you know, um, not doing that, what their competitors are doing. But the reality is now people are seeing the value. They have seen the value in top of industries. But we are not there yet because the problem with blockchain is you need people who understand the value of blockchain. They need to appreciate that. And they need to be comfortable with the governance model that you mentioned, right? The problem with blockchain, 20% of that is technology, 80% of that is adoption around agreeing on some government story. And, and because of that, uh, I want to end on that point that, uh, of course, on AI, there are some challenges about bias that was mentioned, fairness. We are working with universities, and I think we all need to do that. We need to work with government, with universities, to understand these challenges and try to solve them. And that's what we do with you know, Colombia on the topic of blockchain and data transparency, <coughs> identifying the uh, you know, multidisciplinary issues that we have on the topic of data transparency from the legal perspective, from the, uh, you know, the policy perspective, from the business model perspective, from the technology perspective, and also on the AI side, we're working with you know, different universities to identify what are the challenges and how to really advance the state of the art. Great. Um, and, and find all this fascinating. One, one question that came to my mind as I was hearing this, if we're thinking how we can better use big data, big data for, for increasing prosperity as widely as possible, and, and to your point, people are willing to share their data, but they want to know why and how it's going to benefit us. So I guess the question I began wondering is, who owns the data? Who controls the data? And right now, and is there a way to not sort of give, use data as just a business power tool, but to more broadly share it, to give it more broad control so that society can use it for, for its own benefits. So I guess the quick question is, who owns the data, who controls it, and who should? And is there a way to change this? So why don't we just go right down, because I'm curious on everyone think, thinks about this. I think this is, a, this is a good example of how society and our laws are not keeping up with mm -hmm. technology. It used to be that the laws of physics prevented people from looking what's in my file cabinet or what my doctor or my insurance company has. Now, with things in the cloud, um, it's possible for lots of people to have access to that. So we have to have specific rules about who's going to own it. And the traditional rules of, of copyright and, and uh, data um, ownership are inadequate. So people like Sandy Pentland, my colleague at MIT, and, and others are working on a uh, framework to make data ownership more explicit about who creates it and how it's created. I don't think, I, I think it's often say, well, we own our data. That, that's a, a sort of a quick glib kind of answer, but it's more complicated than that because most data is created jointly from interactions among multiple people, and then you have to be explicit about which, which parties have which rights to it and how the value is going to be created. Um, so I don't have a, uh, a silver bullet answer to that question, but it, it's something that um, I'm hoping to hear from my co-panelists maybe a, a better answer. You know, it's a fascinating question because, you know, with today, especially in the AI world, 
Well, you know, most of the data is being used, and that's actually one of the sort of the rules right now in the AI world, one of the governing things is that these large AI systems being trained by whatever data, whatever data the companies can freely get their hands on. Very few companies are actually paying to create large data sets that eliminate and, and, and remove a lot of bias. Um, and it's interesting because you think about it, in the digital world, we don't own our own data. You know, what's in our house, we have some control over it. In the digital world, um, anything that's out there is, is, is fair game. Um, and it was interesting because when I was looking at the data broker community, um, it was amazing. Um, you know, when I reached out to data brokers, um, the general answer was, you have absolutely no right to see what we hold on you. Um, you have no right to know how much money we make on you. You have no right to know any of these things. Um, you don't even have a right to correct what they hold on you. And that was what really struck me. Um, and it actually started because I started getting all these AARP mailers. Um, and so we saw the AARP and they said, there's a guy in his basement in New Jersey um, that is selling, you know, that apparently is selling records saying that, you know, you are over 65 years old now. Um, and that was what really struck me was when I reached out to this, to this guy in his basement in New Jersey, um, the answer was legally you have no right to what we hold, legally you have, you have no right to anything. Um, and that's what I think is, is surprising here is that, you know, as we externalize our minds now, you think about it more and more, what we do, our calendars, our thoughts, everything, we're writing down in the digital world. We're expressing them in some form in the digital world. So we're essentially externalizing our mind. But at the same time, all those traditional rules that get searched and seeker, a lot of the legal rules that govern all these things, none of those apply in the digital world. Um, and so that's a really fascinating one. In fact, if you look at one of the ways that, come, that um, the government's getting around encryption right now here in the US, um, is that your iPhone may be difficult for the FBI to penetrate, um, but if you set up an iCloud backup, uh, a lot of that data is already sitting you know, in there. They just reach, reach around and get to it. Um, so I think that's, that's a fascinating question. We, we haven't quite, you know, in this country, um, but I think Estonia, actually, is it where I have heritage, is a perfect counterexample to that. Um, every single piece of information that the government holds, you control, um, you control access to this. You have a record of that. If you're a doctor, you go and see your doctor, doctor pulls your medical record, you actually get an alert. You actually have a record of that. You know, back before it was called blockchain, is time hash. Um, and so, you know, this is so the government of Estonia has this record, which is immutable. Um, and this is what's really fascinating. You control it. If, you, if you're an Estonian citizen and you want to contribute some of your data to a project, you have to manually authorize each and every project that wants to use your data. You can revoke that authorization at any moment and any usage you see a log of. So it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be this, this way that you know, we have here in the US. Um, which is, you know, whatever a company can get their hands on is fair game and they own and they can profit from. Um, there, there are all these alternatives that I think, you know, we need to think more about. How many of those race grains that we're talking about are actually human generated content? Not very many. And I think that's a critical backdrop to answering this question. So <clears throat> we just can't think about data as content through social media, through healthcare records, through financial records. Um, a very large percentage of the data is actually metadata. It's a data that's gathered uh, from engineering characteristics of the underlying infrastructure. And it's data that's gathered from sensors that were discussed in one of the panels earlier. So this is, we have to, we have to in order to answer that question about who owns data, you have to think about data not as a monolithic category and, and certainly not just as something around human content. So if you, have, if you agree that it's a heterogeneous category, then you have to acknowledge that it is a multi-stakeholder answer to that. So who owns and operates the infrastructure that creates and generates this data? The private sector, uh, telecommunications companies, registries, interconnection companies, the domain name system providers. Um, so there are, there are, there's layer upon layer upon layer of companies that use, that generate data, and use that data for engineering efficiencies, for, and for all kinds of other purposes, some good and some bad. So I would say the answer is um, it's distributed over the private sector and individuals and new global institutions, and in some cases, governments. I think, I don't know who owns it, but I think I know who should own it, right? Who should own it is you, know, you and I, right? We need to own it. And also in control of that. The problem is this. Uh, today, we go from one doctor to another doctor. I'm talking about healthcare because that's the area I've been focusing on. For me to go from one doctor to another doctor, I cannot even get my medical re records transferred, right? Tran transferred. I need to go and do the lab test again. I need to do the imaging again because we haven't designed it because really the reality is we don't own it, right? Or maybe it's called we own it, but we don't, we don't can't control it. In fact, healthcare is one of the industries which is really one of the few industries which is not designed around the consumer, 
experience. Look at any other industries around consumer experiences except healthcare. Um, this is one of the areas that I'm passionate about, and I think, honestly, blockchain could be a solution to help bring that transparency and control in the hands of the consumers, right? I'm not saying they're there yet, but this is the area that I see the stakeholders in the healthcare industry are moving into to make the experience for the consumer better in that sense. But, but we are not there yet, right? Um, I don't know if I answered that question, but that's I, it. Yeah, I think all these perspectives answer to the question in, in a different way. I want to sort of ask the audience for some questions, so begin thinking. Um, I just had one before we go to the audience. I, I, I began thinking, as you all spoke, you spoke about productivity, and it hasn't improved as much as one might hope, and there's been sort of productivity um, paradox. And you spoke about, you go to the doctor, and they maybe they use some of the AI or, or data on, a clini on the clinical side, but none on the genomic side, and none on some of these other variables. So it feels to me like we're still just not just tapping just a bit into the potential here. And I would like to get quick from each one of you, of you, you know, sort of how can we expand that? How can we increase productivity? How can we, on the medical side, you know, so the do doctor isn't just looking at one lab test, but is considering all this data. So how, how can we expand this? So those answers are very much related, and they're part of the same problem, which is that we have some breathtaking breakthroughs in the technology and, and obviously data availability. I love that first paragraph of your, uh, your book. It, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's really quite compelling. Um, but our, our processes, our institutions, our management are, are not anywhere close to keeping up in terms of in, in healthcare, I think, is one of the ones that's particularly lagging. So the data is there in different silos, but we don't have mechanisms for, for having hospitals share. Or, uh, incentives to make them want to share. I think part of the problem is that they don't want to share it because they want to hang on to those uh, customers, those paying customers, or we call them, you know, patients. So, <laughs> so what we need to do is um, uh, spend as much time or more time reinventing our organizations, as we did in the example of electricity. And in, in, in my articles, I have a, a book called AI and the Modern uh, Sorry, an article called AI and the Modern Productivity Paradox that goes through how this is a, a recurring paradox. Every time a major new technology comes along, there's always this puzzle of slow productivity growth with the steam engine, with electricity, with the automobile, with computerization for that matter. Um, and in each case, it's because we haven't reinvented our organization. So I, I would like to see us spend more time on that part of the problem and not uh, worry as much about just simply pushing the technology frontier Further. If we do that, we can. I think we can harness, and we, I, I suspect we will harness very large gains. The pattern that we've seen in, in the past is what's called a productivity J curve, where initially productivity actually falls a bit as people are reorganizing and reinventing, but then later they harvest um, all of that and more, and the payoff um, comes. But sometimes after five, ten, or more years. Yeah, I mean, I, I think actually it's certainly is. Interesting. Model in this particular case, and that you know, in the Estonian model, um, if you change doctors, if you're traveling somewhere else in the country, and hey, you need to go to another doctor, your records are all centrally are all centrally there. They're shared. They're controlled by you. Um, but what's also interesting there, speaking of like medical research and genomics, um, Estonia has this really fascinating genomics uh, research program that they're doing right now, uh, where they're asking people to contribute data to that. Um, but again, because you know, every citizen controls their own data, it's a very voluntary thing where each individual citizen decides which of their data to contribute to that, uh, which parts of that, under what conditions do they want that to be you know, part of that. And I think this is a really interesting model that when people have more control of their data, more of an investment in that, it's not, well, you know, hey, I want, face I want to use Facebook for free, so I'm going to allow it to hoover up my data and do whatever it wants with it. I want to use Twitter for free, so I actually allow Twitter to actually resell, actually literally back, back uh, you know, zip up my, uh, zip my uh, tweets and sell those to people. Um, you know, I think it's an interesting model. We kind of shift to this model of more control. And you know, people say, well, that's impossible. That can never happen. Well, it does happen. Um, but I think it's also interesting, too, once you have more of that automation of things, like, a, like a, the former president of Estonia, Ilves, um, one of his you know, famous things, you can't drive a computer. Um, that as they took their government, so for those that don't know, the Estonian government, um, everything's visual there. 
on so all of your services. You can, you know, you file your taxes from your phone to five minutes of voting. You actually may anticipate that there might be uh, interference with voting. So you vote from one device, like your computer. You verify your vote separately from another device. So even if one's compromised, you see what was actually registered for you. Um, you can vote as many times as you want up until the moment uh, that voting closes because they even anticipate, I think this is something technologists don't often think about, is they build technology. They don't think about how it might be used in real life. So in the Estonian system, they assume, well, you know, maybe you're a factory worker. Maybe your boss says, you know what, I want you to vote for this candidate, so I'm going to watch you vote to make sure that you do this. Um, so that's why you can vote as many times as you want. So you can just go home and vote the way you want to vote. Um, and so there's all these controls because they've really thought about what are the ways in which technology can be misused? What are the ways it can, it can have harm? Um, and specifically, the digitization of their government really came about from that idea that if everything's digital and there's no humans in the loop, um, there's no one to bribe. There's no one to, you know, to, to work things another way. So I think that's kind of this interesting model of when data and technology are, what we really think about the second order effects of that, and we, we restore that control. I think there's some real interesting things there. A very, very short time ago in history, someone who used one email platform couldn't send email to someone who used another company's platform. That is just a fact, and that was a fact in my lifetime. And it was a huge leap forward for innovation and efficiency to have open standards and interoperability standards that could make all of those technologies work together. So I would say the part, a partial answer to your question is that we would, we would have a, a similar leap forward if we had open standards and greater interoperability in that space. And what that means is technical standards that are not inhibited overly by intellectual property rights in the form of standards-based patents. What it would mean is uh, coordination and cooperation and having standards that are openly published so that, let's say, if you and I started a company, we could build products that would be ensured to be interoperable with other products in, for example, the healthcare environment. That doesn't mean that there would be mandatory sharing of data. It just means that if we wanted to share it, we could. Great. Uh, um, the answer is that the, the true north of south goal, right, uh, for everyone is to go and get all of this data, the 360 degree of the patients, and build the model that can capture and analyze and bring insight. Everybody wants to go there. But the reality is to go there is a long time. And we are at the very beginning of really bringing AI to understand data, right? As we heard earlier today, we have three categories of AI. AI, there's a narrow AI, which everybody is focusing right now. And then there's something called broad AI, which is one layer above the narrow AI that people are doing that. Uh, you know, in, you know, the research lab are focusing, the academia are focusing on bringing that. And then there's this general AI, which I don't, I don't know if we get there or not. We are at the narrow AI stage. We are at the very infancy of AI. At some point, we will get there, but you know, it takes time. But the good thing about AI capability versus the, this programmable system era is the AI system, as it learns and gets better data, it gets better and better. It doesn't get obsolete. And that's the beauty. That's why we are not going to be done ever. We're going to always make the AI system better. Yeah, and also I think a big part of this discussion is, do we trust AI? And does the public, the non-technologists, trust AI? And one issue that has come up a lot recently is algorithm, algorithmic bias, which came up this morning in the discussion, and it's when AI sort of, well, I, I won't even bother to explain. I, I'm, I'm going to let Eric, who has thought a lot about this, but I think it comes down to, do we trust AI? Or should we trust AI? Yeah, that, that's a really important question, and we shouldn't give blind trust to AI or, or people, for that matter. Um, and I, I think that the, the challenge is that as AI machine learning systems start making more and more decisions, parole decisions, uh, lending decisions, medical decisions about who gets care, who gets triage, uh, hiring decisions, um, it's often becoming increasingly opaque how these mis decisions are being made. Um, neural nets may have. Uh, hundreds of thousands or, or even hundreds of millions of weights on their neurons, and it's, it's impossible or meaningless for us to look at those weights and try to understand how that decision was made. So the real danger is, is as I think all three of my uh, co-panelists here have emphasized, is that if you have garbage in, you get garbage out, and the data, the systems are trained on human data, and not just erroneous data, but explicitly biased data, because 
all of us are biased, and the judges are biased, the hiring people are biased, um, the, the medical doctors have implicit bias, and that gets fed in to the systems, and then they can amplify and perpetuate that bias. But I want to leave on an optimistic note, because ultimately I'm optimistic about this, which is that these systems can be corrected, and in fact, I think they're easier to correct than humans are. It's very hard to, to keep humans from being biased. You talk to Danny Kahneman or others, and uh, that, is, that is a difficult task. The systems, on the other hand, we can test them. Some of my colleagues at MIT have developed something called a, a Turing box, where you feed in many different inputs into the system and many different outputs, and you start being able to detect patterns. You can see if it has some of the uh, biases that we don't want, and then you can tweak it to eliminate or at least reduce those biases. I don't think that we will necessarily ever get to a perfect unbiased system. In fact, I know we won't because um, the researchers in the field have shown that it's mathematically impossible to eliminate all different kinds of bias simultaneously. They are logically incompatible. If you have more type one error, then you can, then, then you can have less type two error, but you can't eliminate both of them at the same time, for instance, and there are more subtle examples of that as well. But I do think that the big virtue of, these, of this approach is that we can make explicit what our values are, and we can decide, rather than have somebody in the spur of the moment, a human, make a decision that may be biased, we can code in and say, okay, which kinds of trade-offs are we comfortable making with, and how can we minimize the overall amount of bias? So the path forward, I think, is actually more reliance on these systems, not less, but with our, a clear-eyed view that the data going into them is going to be biased, and we need to work very hard to minimize and control the types of biases that are in there. Right, which is, I think, sort of reinforces where I tried to begin this discussion is, the more we understand this technology, the more we can make better decisions. We're going to break for lunch in just a minute, so I wanted to give each of the panelists a sort of a wrap-up, final words. Why don't we start in reverse order? Great. Uh, I would say uh, there are a lot of work to be done in AI, in blockchain, and just one quick note is we definitely need a partnership between all the stakeholders and also better education of the, the consumers about what this AI is, what blockchain is, or how it's going to impact their, their life. But again, my, my, uh, I've been focusing a lot on basically making sure that we get you know, partnership with industries and academia to really understand the issue. It's going to be a long time before we get there, but we need to start now and get there. We're in a post-consent environment around artificial intelligence and digital technologies in that all of the data gathered, or much of the data gathered, is not something that comes through screens anymore. It's come, it comes through ambient data collection. So what that means, if people cannot make decisions about their own privacy and their own rights, we have to, as a society, ask the question of what kind of a world we want to live in. And I would just close with a, a pitch for we need a comprehensive privacy regime in this country. Yeah, I think, you know, real quickly on the, the AI fairness thing, I, I think one of the challenges is because we're relying on, on free data. We're relying on what companies can get free um, instead of saying what is the data that will actually represent, um, you know, the, the thing that we're trying to build AI to replace. And I think specifically in the corporate world, companies have really focused on dropping AI in to replace a person. So they say, here's a person, have the machine, watch them, uh, and then basically mimic them. So that means that it learns all the exact biases it learns. It basically does things the way they did. Um, instead of saying, well, how do we set out to do this in a better way? Um, and I think, you know, and again, one of the dangerous parts with, with AI in particular is we say, well, you know, this can't be biased because it's math. It's mathematics here. It's, it can't be biased. Um, and so I think, again, also helping the public understand. And I think really my, my word would actually be, you know, on a, on a note of optimism to say, look, I think, you know, data and AI, it's enabling all kinds of new applications. Um, I think when we stop thinking of this as this apocalypse of, you know, my God, you know, machines and data, you know, data is going to do this, machines are going to take over all our jobs and render us, et cetera, et cetera. I think when we start thinking about it rationally, we say, well, where are we today? You know, there's, there's data, there are machines. Machines are able to do these interesting incremental things. They're helping us in many powerful ways. When we think about it in that, instead of this, you know, this kind of, you know, way down the line science fiction thing, I think it really helps kind of put things in perspective in a much more optimistic way.
I think of AI as a general purpose technology, and that has an economic meaning. Uh, the steam engine, electricity, uh, raw computation were examples of earlier general purpose technologies. Each of them had profound effects, not just on productivity, but on the nature of the economy itself. And each of them took decades to unfold. Uh, in each case, while the technology was the catalyst, the real important decisions were made at the societal level by policymakers, by managers, by all of us as citizens. I'm so glad we have this panel here and, and this, this conference here because it's time for us as a society to not delegate these important decisions just to technologists, but for re to recognize that the vast bulk of decision making has to be made with people who care about the direction that this is going on. We have a, a rocket ship now with more powerful engines than we've ever had before, but what's needed most of all is the steering mechanism of where we want to point that rocket ship. And over the, the next few uh, decades, um, I'm hopeful that we can point it in the right direction, but I have to say that looking back to when I wrote my book, The Second Machine Age with, with Andrew McAfee, um, how things have changed since then, if anything, the technology has advanced more rapidly than we anticipated, and there are lots of examples of, of that, but our ability in the political sphere and in the economic sphere and the business sphere to cope with those changes has been incredibly disappointing. We've, in some ways, we've actually moved backwards. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, that a group like this here in this audience can help be some of the people that catalyze a more sensible set of policies along the lines of what we discussed in the panel, what we've discussed over the past, few, the past day. I think that's a great place to leave it. Um, let's break for lunch, but let's thank the, the panelists. <laughs>